morning, everyone. Happy Sabbath. I want to welcome everyone. Today, we are continuing the prophecies of Daniel and the Revelation. We're looking at the closing events. And those closing events that we're looking at fall under the last three angel movements of Revelation 14. Before we begin, let us pray. Heavenly Father, merciful God, a wonderful Savior, as we tabernacle with you this morning, we ask, Father, that your word will be made very clear to our understanding. Give us the mind of Jesus Christ so that we will be able to grasp the truths of prophecy. Hide me behind the cross, O oh Father. Take control of this period of study. And as your word goes forth, may hearts be touched and lives be saved. In Jesus' name, amen. So we want to review as we begin this study this morning and a quick review of the seven angels which we have been looking at and we said before, those are seven movements of Revelation chapter 14. So it is not three angels merely, nor even four. But there are seven angels. And we have seen in previous study that the first four angels represent movements for the proclamation of the everlasting gospel which began with the first angel's message, Revelation 14, 6 and 7. The last three angels of Revelation 14 represent movements that will reveal righteous perfection before the unfallen universe, which is, who is always looking on, and before the wicked, who have finally rejected the gospel. However, while displaying righteous perfection, God's people will not have an intercessor during the time of Jacob's trouble. So that is a solemn time, and we want to see how it all unfolds from the word of God. Now, the gospel uh, produces a twofold effect. A twofold effect. Number one, it is impossible for anybody to reject the saving work of God and remain unaffected by the, by the resistance or rejection. We have an example in the deterioration of spiritual and moral experience of the Jews who persisted in their opposition to the Messiah. From men who at the outset of Christ's ministry, so when Christ's ministry began, they possessed a fair degree of respectability and decency. So these were decent men. They were very respectable men when Christ began his ministry. But because they rejected Christ and the gospel that he brought, by the end of that ministry, they had developed into ferocious demons, thirsting like wild animals for the Savior's blood. So there was a deterioration from where they were to what they had become as a result of rejecting that which alone 
could keep them how they were and even improve their behavior and character. On the other hand, this is the second effect. It is impossible to accept the light of the gospel without experiencing daily transformation to perfection. We have an example. From men who have been rough and unlearned, the disciples of Christ grew in divine grace until they reached such a height of moral and spiritual perfection, men who would sacrifice anything for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. So one is growth to perfection, those who accept the gospel, and those who reject the gospel will degenerate into less than humans. That is a twofold effect of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Christ, uh, we're looking at this parable again. We looked at it last Sabbath. We're looking at it again. It has a lot, a lot in it. We want to understand the end. Where, where does the end start? And where does it finish? We want to understand the harvest. What does the Bible mean when it speaks of the harvest? And how does that relate to the close of human probation. Okay. Christ speaking says, he's explaining the parable of the wheat and tears. He that sowed the good seed is the son of man. That's the first explanation to this parable. The field is what? So the, the, the sower is the son of man. And he sows in the world because that is a field. But he sows good seed. The good seed are the children of the kingdom. What are the tears? The tears are the children of whom? The wicked one. The enemy that sowed the tears is the devil. The harvest is what? The harvest is, the harvest is the end of the world, and the reapers are the angels. So we're looking, we're focusing on the harvest and the end, the harvest is the end of the world. So when we find out what is the end of the world, we will find out the harvest. Okay. Harvest. The latter rain. This is last the event, page 183, paragraph 1 and 2. The latter rain falling near the close of the season ripens the grain and prepares it for the sickle. Because remember, the fourth angel is the son of man appearing in Revelation 14, 14 with a sharp sickle. So the latter rain falling near the close of the season ripens the grain and prepares it for the sickle. The ripening of the grain represents the completion of the work of God's grace in the soul. By the power of the Holy Spirit, the moral image of God is to be perfected in the character. We are to be wholly transformed into the likeness of Christ, end of quote. What do we gather from this? The latter rain, falling near the close of the season, ripens the grain and prepares it for the sickle or the harvest. And the ripening of the grain represents the completion of the work of God's grace in the soul. When the work of God's grace in the soul is completed, it means that we have reached harvest ripe perfection. It is time to reap the harvest. The Bible tells us in another place that as soon as the harvest has come, he puts in the sickle. That's Mark 4, 28 and 29. Okay. Matthew continues, Christ continues rather. 
As therefore the tears are gathered and buried in the fire, burns are in the fire, so shall it be in the end of this world. So, in the end of the world, wherever we find the tears being gathered to be burned, that's the end of the world. And when we go to Revelation, we see that it occupies a period of time from angel 5 to angel 7. The Son of Man, Revelation 14, 14, shall send forth his angels, and they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend, and them which do iniquity, and shall cast them into a furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. We see this in Revelation 14, 17 to 19. Then shall the righteous shine forth at the sun in the kingdom of their father. Who had ears to hear? Let him hear. The righteous shine forth in the, as the sun in the kingdom of their father. Revelation 14, 1 tells us that the righteous are on Mount Zion with the father's name in the forehead. Early writings 279, paragraph 1. Wheat and tears in the time of Jacob's trouble. So we are specifically focusing on the time of the end. So far, it appears that the time of the end begins, or the end begins, sorry, at the closure of probation, and it runs right through to the coming of the Son of Man. So it is a time period. And if that is so, then that is the time period of the harvest. But let us see. Inspiration. I was pointed down to the time when the third angel's message was closing. The power of God had rested upon his people. They had accomplished what? Their work. And were prepared for the trying hour before them. So the work was completed. They had received a latter rain past tense. Or refreshing from the presence of the Lord. And the living testimony had been revived. The last great warning had sounded everywhere. Past tense. It had stirred up and enraged the inhabitants of the earth. Who would not receive the message. So now we have two classes. As the work closes. The wheat and the tears. The harvest must now take place. Or the writings to 80 paragraph 1. While Jesus had been ministering in the sanctuary. The judgment had been going on. For the righteous dead. And then for the righteous living. Christ had received his kingdom. Remember Daniel 7. He went into the Father to receive his kingdom. Having made the atonement for his people and blotted out their sins because he that is righteous must now remain righteous forever. The subjects of the kingdom were made up. Somebody asked if the 144,000 is a literal number. God does not refuse. All right? The subjects of the kingdom were made up. The marriage of the Lamb was consummated. So all of these things happened as Christ completed his work in the first, the second apartment, sorry, of the heavenly sanctuary. Now once Christ leaves the heavenly sanctuary, this is what happens. It was impossible. Now listen. We're looking at the harvest. And of course, there are going to be two harvests. The harvest of the, of the wheat and the harvest of the tears, which we are told in uh, Matthew 13. Okay? But once, once Christ was in the, while Christ was in the most holy place, we are told certain things could not happen. It was impossible for the plagues to be poured out. While Jesus officiated in the sanctuary. 
He was standing there between God and guilty man. And he would receive the, the confession of anyone who says, Lord, be merciful to me. Remember me like the thief on the cross when thou comest into thy kingdom. But once he leaves, his work is finished. His intercession closes. There is nothing to stay the wrath of God. And it breaks with fury upon whom? Upon the shelterless head of the guilty sinner. So you're either, you're either guilty or you're righteous and will remain righteous forever. So probation has closed and some things begin to happen and we don't have to ask who's a tear or a wheat at that time because those who are not saved will experience the plagues. We are told it breaks with fury upon the shelterless head of the guilty sinner who has slighted salvation and hated reproof. In that fearful time, after the close of Jesus' mediation, the saints were living in the sight of of a holy God without an intercessor. So we have to stop here and understand what this means. It means that all that Christ is doing now in the heavenly sanctuary is to bring his people to perfection that cannot be reversed. Irreversible perfection. It also means that everything that God can do for me now, like Daniel, I must let him do it for me. I must aim to the to reach the highest mark of perfection because I will have to be sealed in righteousness so that when Christ leaves the sanctuary, I do not need an intercessor anymore. Harvest ripe perfection. Harvest ripe perfection. So the saints will not have an intercessor, but they will not need one. But the only way that we will reach this point is if we let God do for us what he is there waiting to do for us. If we do not allow him to work for us, his work will be finished and we will be left with a, an incomplete work of, of souls, of the soul. In other words, I will not be perfect in Christ to the point where I can, I can live without an intercessor in the sight of a holy God. All right? That would be a fearful time, as we are told in this quotation, because the close of Jesus' mediation would have taken place. Another event. We're going to just deal with this quickly and then move on. As Jesus left the sanctuary, Jesus tarried a moment in the outer apartment of the heavenly sanctuary. The outer apartment of the earthly sanctuary was the courtyard. The outer apartment of the heavenly sanctuary is this earth. In other words, what this simply means, Jesus not, might not be in the earth, but he has left this, the sanctuary and he is already on his way to the earth. He tarried a moment in the outer apartment of the heavenly sanctuary and the sins which had been confessed while he was in the most holy place, were placed upon Satan where he dwells. The originator of sin, who must suffer the punishment. All right? So all of that, those are events that will take place when Jesus has left this, the early, the, um, heavenly sanctuary. Now in the third angel's movement, we see something development here. We see a little development. It says, Great Controversy 427, paragraph 2. This is speaking of the, another parable called the parable of the ten virgins. Under the figure, figure of the third angel's movement, we are told in the parable, it was those that had oil in their vessels with their lamps that went into the marriage. How did they go into the marriage? Now all of that happened under the third angel's movement 
when the sanctuary was introduced after the disappointment of the Advent people. What was introduced to them? It says, these saw the truth concerning the sanctuary in heaven and the Savior's change in ministration and by faith, oh praise the Lord, they followed him in his work in the sanctuary above. So we can follow Christ. They followed Christ by faith. That is how they got into the sanctuary. They were following him as they received the message of the sanctuary. They understood that he was not to come to earth. He was to move from one apartment to the next of the heavenly sanctuary. And they went there by faith. And knew that he was now doing a different work on their behalf. So the third angel's movement of people followed Christ into the sanctuary by faith under the third angel's message. We skip the fourth angel and we come to the fifth. Revelation 18, 1 to 4 speaks of the fourth angel's work. We want to come to the fifth angel because this angel comes out of the temple. The word of God says, another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him that sat on the cloud. This is the fifth angel. Trust in thy sickle and reap. For the time has come for thee to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. Now we know in Revelation 14, 14, that the fourth angel appears with a sharp sickle in his hand. But the fifth angel comes out of the temple and speaks to the fourth angel who has the sharp sickle. How do we understand this? Follow. Those who follow the leading of the spirit when the work closes, which we've just looked at, when the enthusiasm which animated them is gone, which we are told in the next quotation, and they flee to the mighty one for strength, those are the ones represented here in, in uh, Revelation 14, 15. All right? And this is Revelation 14, 15 and 16. Okay? Another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him that sat on the cloud, angel four. What do they say? Trust in thy sickle and reap, for the time has come for thee to do what? To reap, so the harvest begins at the close of human probation when Christ is no longer in the heavenly sanctuary. But the movement symbolized by the angel followed Christ into the heavenly sanctuary by faith. And now, under the fifth angel, they come out. The Bible says they came out of the temple crying with a loud voice. Wow. Great Controversy 608. This is the launching, the description of the launching of the fifth angel's movement. It says, in this time of persecution, the faith of the Lord's servants will be tried. They have faithfully given the warning past tense. The work is closed. Looking to God and to his word alone. The enthusiasm which animated them is gone, yet they cannot turn back. Then, feeling their utter helplessness, they flee to the mighty one for strength. In other words, here is a people who are accustomed so whenever they feel weak, they run to Jesus Christ. Praise the Lord. What do you do when you feel weak? Do you go to Jesus? If, this, if you're in the habit of running to Jesus for strength, then you will do that. In other words, they will find themselves automatically speaking to Christ. When the animation is gone and the work is closing, or the work has closed, they will feel a need because of the loss of the spirit flowing through them. They remember that the words which they have spoken were not theirs, but his who bade them give the warning. 
God put the truth into their hearts and they could not forbear to proclaim it. So they felt the power of the Holy Spirit to proclaim the word. And then they felt the loss of the Holy Spirit when the work was closed and they don't need it anymore. And they feel the need for help and strength. We don't have help. We need help and strength. And they run to Jesus. Figuratively, they're saying, trust in thy sickle and reap. For the time has come for thee to reap. For the harvest of the earth is ripe. Simply put. So the fifth angel does an important work. We're going to review this as we go along. The fifth angel does not finalize the Lord's work. The gospel is closed with the fourth angel's message or movement. The fifth angel does not finalize the Lord's work, not the gospel. God has other work other than the gospel. Through this fifth angel's movement, the Lord reveals the light of his character in such clarity and brilliance that even the most wicked person on the earth will be led to see and to acknowledge the beauty, the justice, and the righteousness of God in the demonstration of his spirit and his life in his people. So God's spirit and life will so be in his people that it will be demonstrated that the most wicked person will be led to acknowledge. This is a conviction that must be given even after probation closes. So the sixth angel does what? We are told, Revelation 14, 17, another angel came out of the temple which is in heaven again. He also having a sharp sickle. So we have two angels with a sharp sickle. We angel 1, Revelation 14, 14. Angel 2, Revelation 14, 17. The 144,000 made up under the closing ministry of the fourth angel follow the lamb wherever he goes. So, under the third angel's movement, they went into the most holy place by faith. They were, they, they were then facing a final test, the mark of the beast crisis. Once that is completed, the work closes and they are now sealed, righteous forever. They're made up, the number is made up, the 144,000. And they follow the Lamb, according to Revelation 14:4, wherever he goes. So when he comes out of the temple, they will follow him out of the temple. So angel 5, look at this. The members of the fifth and sixth angels movement are the same because they remain righteous forever. However, it was not God's will, even in angel one's movement, that a large proportion of the people who came out to form the first angels movement should have failed to follow on with the second angel as his work began and developed. That was very unfortunate. The work of God was delayed again and again because of human imperfection and failure. But once probation has closed, there will be no more delay and not one person will fall away into apostasy after the closure of probation. Neither will any be called upon to lay down his life once the final seal has been affixed. Therefore, Every member of the fifth angel's movement will go on to be a part of the sixth angel's movement because they will remain righteous forever and the seventh angel's movement as well. So we have all the movements after angel four has the same people because they remain righteous forever. Wherever this lamb goes, they go. The seventh angel comes out of the altar. The Bible tells us, well, if the seventh angel comes out of the altar, it means that the lamb had to go to the altar. Does Christ go to the altar after probation close? 
Does Christ go to the altar after he comes out of the, the holy place, the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary? You sure? Let us see. That is why we need Revelation 14. We need to understand the entire chapter of Revelation 14. The seven angel comes out of the altar, which means that Christ had to go to the altar. Wow. We thank God for Leviticus. However, Revelation 14, 18 says, Another angel came out from the altar, who had power over fire. And he cried with a loud cry to him who had the sharp sickle, saying, Trust in your sharp sickle and gather the clusters of the vine of the earth, for her grapes are fully ripe. This angel speaks to the sixth angel and tells him, You have a reaping to do too. So the harvest, the wheat, the wheat is harvested, and now the tears must be harvested. Wow. Listen. Where does he come from? Why does he get from, come from the altar? Leviticus 16. The word of God tells us, this is after Aaron came out of the most holy place on the day of atonement of the earthly sanctuary. Remember, that's a typical heavenly sanctuary experience. And Aaron shall come into the tabernacle of the congregation and shall put off the linen garments which he put on when he went into the holy place and shall leave them there. And he shall wash his flesh with water in the holy place and put on his garments and come forth and offer his burnt offering and the burnt offering of the people and make an atonement for himself and for the people and the fat of the sin offering shall he burn upon the altar. This is after he comes out on the day of atonement. So brethren, what will you understand here? Christ is going to have to go back to die on Calvary's cross for us again. So his death on his blood is efficacious even after he leaves the heavenly sanctuary. He can cleanse us from earthliness without having to go back to Calvary. Praise the Lord. Bless the Lord. Amen. The altar and the outer court of the heavenly sanctuary, therefore, we are told in um, General Conference Bulletin, February 15. Inspiration says, believers on the earth and those who have never fallen in heaven are one church. Oh, praise the Lord. Every heavenly intelligence is entrusted in the assemblies of the saints. So you are here today and heaven is entrusted in what is happening here now. In the inner court in heaven, they listen to the testimonies of the witnesses for Christ in the outer court on earth. This is the outer court of the heavenly sanctuary. So Christ comes back to this earth, and in coming back to this earth, the saints must go through a time of purification from earthliness, not from sin. The word of God tells us during that time, a lot of things will be happening. This is reaping the wrath of God. The wicked reaps the wrath of God. How does that happen? Revelation 14, 19 to 20. So the angel trusts in his sickle, remember? Angel 7 says, trust in your sickle. Come on and get the work done. So the move, six angels movement has a work to accomplish. Trust in his sickle into the earth and he gathered the vine of the earth. And what he did with it. He threw it into the great wine press of the wrath of God. And the wine press was trampled outside the city. And blood came out of the wine press up to the horse's bridle for 1,600 for long. This harvest is a harvest of death. This is a harvest of an engathering of souls, not the eternal life, but the eternal death in which millions will perish. The slaughter will be so terrible and extensive that only the 144,000 made up during the close of Fort Angel's movement will survive. 
It will be achieved by a combination of two things, and we must understand the character of God in this matter. The unrestrained fury of the wicked, which leads them to attack one another. The Bible talks about that. And we saw an example of attacking one another in, in, Mount Se in the time of Jehoshaphat, when Mount Seir and the children of Ammon came to fight with Israel. And when God withdrew his, himself, his spirit, they destroyed one another. That was an example of what will happen at the end of this world. So the harvest is an engagement, sorry, the slaughter will be so terrible, we've looked at that already. It will be achieved by a combination of two things. The unrestrained fury of the wicked, which leads them to attack one another with unbridled ferocity. That's number one. And number two, the awful outpouring of the seventh plague. Wow. Destruction of the earth. Because the elements are now collapsing. Let's go to the Bible. To prove this point and then we close. Jeremiah 25, 33. In the mad strife, well, we're not going there, we, let's quote first and then we'll look at Jeremiah. In the mad strife of their own fierce passions, we're looking at great controversy, 657. And by the awful outpouring of God's amigo wrath, two things. The mad strife of their own fierce passions, passion, human passion, unrestrained by the Spirit of God, you will do things that you never thought possible. For all the wicked inhabitants of the earth, priests, rulers and people, rich and poor, high and low, and the slain of the Lord, the Bible says, Jeremiah 25, 33, shall be at that day from one end of the earth, even to the other end of the earth, they shall not be lamented, neither gathered nor buried, because there will be no one to cry, no one to lament, and no one to bury you. It's all over. All over. The slain of the Lord shall be at that day from one end of the earth even on the other end of the earth. There can be no lamentation because there's no one to lament. The 144,000 will display the character of God during that time. How will they display it? Under the fifth angel's movement, there's an aspect of God's character that the 144,000 must display. The fifth angel has brought the guilty inhabitants of the earth to a true realization of God's character and of their own rejection of divine light and truth. In other words, under the fifth angel, as the, as the 144,000 are attacked, they will display love for hatred. After which, this awesome destruction we spoke about, or we just read about, of human life will really get on the way. Angel 6. Another aspect of God's character. Now the wicked, the first reaction of the wicked, after they see the character of God so fully displayed, will be to fall at the saints' feet in hearty acknowledgement of the correctness of the position maintained by them. They will confess in heartbroken soul, destroying anguish, the evil of their own ways. It will be a terrible moment of truth, which will be horrible to look upon, and even worse, to even experience. But, uh, but the fifth, the sixth angel movement will, ex will see the wicked coming to bow and worship at their feet according to Revelation. Now, watch this. What does the, let us see Great Controversy 655, 655 explains this. It says the people see that they've been deluded. They accuse one another of having led them to destruction. But all unite in heaping their bitterest condemnation upon the ministers. Unfaithful pastors have prophesied smooth things. 
They have led their hearers to make void the law of God and to persecute those who would keep it holy. When we talk about this, people say, well, that's not going to happen. Nobody's going to persecute you for keeping the, the true Sabbath of the Bible. If the word of God is true, watch it. We're not far from that time. No. In their despair, these teachers confess before the world their work of deception. And believers, this confession is important for the unfallen universe. When the unfallen universe hear that confession, they will know for sure that God was right in the great controversy and Satan was always wrong. Always wrong. So this movement has to, this has to happen. The work that takes place after probation closes it's very important to stabilize the universe for eternity so that transgression will not rise up a second time. So, after probation closes, those three movements are very important to stabilize the universe forever. Jesus cannot come before this work is accomplished. The seven angels movement. What is the aspect of God's character that they will reveal? We're told in the book of Ezekiel chapter 9, we, we, look, we saw this before. The Lord said unto him, this is speaking of the slaughter. After probation closes, go through the midst of the city, through the midst of Jerusalem, and set a mark upon the foreheads of the men that sigh and that cry, for all the abominations that be done in the midst thereof. Revelation 7, 1 to 3 speaks of the seal of God in the forest of God's people. After that, to the others he said in mine hearing, Go ye after him through the city, and smite. Let not your eyes spare, neither have ye pity. Slay utterly old and young, both maids and little children. And women, but come not near any man upon whom is the mark, and begin at my sanctuary. Then they began at the ancient men which were before the house. Oh, praise the Lord. What does this, all of this mean? Believers, let me tell you something. This will happen in not in the, the very far future. In the very near future, this will happen after probation closes. What this means... Whether you are Adventist, whether you belong to the Sunday church, if you are an unfaithful pastor, then you will have to face this calamity. And those you have whom you have deceived will be all involved in the slaughter. This is not a slaughter done by the people of God. We just spoke about the children of Ammon and Mount Seir killing one another. They came to fight with the people of God and this, this word, this um, quick text quotes, through the midst of Jerusalem. They came to fight with the people of God but when God withdrew his spirit they end up slaying each other below the mount. Where were the people of God? They were on top of the mount singing to the praises and glorifying God. The battle of Jehoshaphat. So here we are saying that all unfaithful pastors and those who have followed them will, will be slaying one another. We have seen that the, the two things that will cause destruction, we saw it already. The strife of their own fierce passions and the awful outpouring of God's unmingled wrath for the wicked inhabitants of the earth. This is, so, this is true. We've seen this already. All right? So Ezekiel 4, 9, or 9, 4 to 6, 
must be interpreted by the other paragraphs that we've read. Let us look at another one. Zechariah 14, 12, and 13 speaks of the same thing. The question is, who accomplishes the final destruction? Is it God? The Bible says, and this shall be the plague wherewith the Lord will smite. Using the same wording as in Ezekiel 9, 4 to 6. Smite all the people that have fought against Jerusalem. Again, the same wording. Listen now. Their flesh shall consume away while they stand upon their feet. And their eyes shall consume away in their holes. And their tongue shall consume away in their mouth. And it shall come to pass in that day. That a great tumult from the Lord shall be among them. And they shall lay hold everyone on the hand of a neighbor. And his hand shall rise up against the hand of his neighbor. They will kill one another. Is that clear enough? Slaughter against one another. The Lord warns us about this. Finally. What is God doing today then? Prophet and Kings 277. The time is at hand. Believers. When there will be sorrow in the world. That no human ban can heal. Listen. The spirit of God is being withdrawn. If the spirit of God is withdrawn. Nothing can stand. Everything will collapse. Even the minds of men will go haywire. When the Spirit of God was withdrawn from Jerusalem after or just before his destruction, after Christ went back to heaven, men suspected one another and started to sort of, they were suspicious of each other and would kill one another for nothing. They had gangs, marauding gangs at night so would attack one another. When we see those young boys get in the gangs and fighting one another, we we'll think, what is that happening? The Spirit of God being withdrawn from the earth. Mad strife. We don't need to wait until those things happen to find a shelter in Jesus Christ, believers. The only safe place is in Christ. Listen. The Spirit of God has been withdrawn. Disasters, and that's why disasters will happen. Because when God created this world, the Spirit of God held everything in perfect conformity to the will of God. When the flood came in the time of Noah, after men, the imagination of men's heart became evil continually. They were saying in actual fact, God, we don't want you. And when the Spirit of God was withdrawn eventually and collapsed the water above the firmament that God put there in Genesis um, chapter 2, 1 and 2, collapsed and the water under the earth burst the fountains and came up. And God warned them, he said there would be a flood by Noah, Noah and the, the men laughed at Noah. But God knew how he made the world and he was just saying, if I depart, as you're asking me to depart, this is what is going to happen. And now we're living in the end, and God is saying the same thing to us, this is what can happen, and people don't believe. Don't wait till things start to go, it is going here, why are you already? When you see the United States, the, the, the champion of democracy, now have the same problems like Guyana, Me, uh, political problems, we are collapsed all over the world. Who are you going to look to? The Spirit of God is gradually being, being withdrawn from the earth and collapse is taking place in every aspect of society. So in schools, they are ready to force young people into believing in homosexuality and lesbianism and all these things. Why? Because Satan has a program. The whole world must be destroyed. Beginning with the minds of the young people. They can do that because the Spirit of God is being withdrawn. And as the Spirit of God is withdrawn, the protections are being removed. 
When we were small, nothing like that could happen. Disasters by sea and by land follow one another in quick succession. What caused the disaster in the days of Noah? The Bible tells us in Genesis 6 that the minds of men were only evil continually. They were in actual fact saying, according to Job, interpreted, Job says they were saying to the, to the Most High, depart from us. When we, when we give ourselves to wickedness, we are telling God, we don't want anything to do with you. That's the body language. And God respects body language. When you say to God, you don't want him, but torn into evil continually, then God says, oh, you don't want anything to do with me. I am pleading with you by my spirit, and now you have committed yourself to evil. I have to respect that. And when God's spirit removes, collapse will take place because the only way this world can be held in check is by the Spirit of God. If the Spirit of God does not hold this world in check, it will collapse. And that's why in the days of Abraham, just before Sodom and Gomorrah was destroyed, the Lord came down to see if the cry that was coming up was true. And he came and he, conf he conf communed with Abraham. And told Abraham, this is what is going to happen. Sodom and Gomorrah will be destroyed and your nephew is living there. And Abraham became very much concerned. Abraham said, well, 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 Lord, tell me if, if the righteous is in there, will you still destroy that city? The Lord said, I will not destroy it if you have enough righteous people to plead for that city. Abraham went down to 40, 30 10. The Lord said, I will not destroy it even for 10. But when the angels got into Sodom, how many righteous were there? They did not have 10. Lot, and who else? And the Lord had to hold the hand of Lot and say, get out of this place, because he began to hesitate, and by hesitating, his wife felt at liberty to look back and she became a pillar of salt. Her heart was in Sodom. Our heart must be in heaven. Jesus says, I have, I, I want to save you. I'm pointing you away from this earth. This earth is ripe for destruction. But I have gone to prepare a place for you. And if I go, I will come back and receive you to myself. That's the kingdom that Christ is going to receive. And he's coming back for his people. Let us close. Disasters by sea and by land follow one another in quick succession. Apparently, these calamities are capricious outbreaks of disorganized, unregulated forces of nature, wholly beyond the control of man. So we don't have control when we see calamities taking place, and sometimes you want to know, how come the big hurricane or a big tornado or something Listen, God has a purpose. But in them all, God's purpose may be read. They are among the agencies by which he seeks to arouse men and women to a sense of their danger. There's a lot of danger up ahead, believers. There's a lot of danger up ahead. God is allowing these calamities now that are falling mingled with mercy as a warning to us to flee from the wrath to come. May we take the warning seriously. Find yourself in Christ. Make your peace with God. Make your calling and election sure. Surrender your heart to Jesus Christ. Ask him daily to sanctify your mind, to transform you according to Romans 12. Be not conformed to this world, but be renewed or transformed by the renewing of your mind. Do not be conformed to this world. 
Do not conform to the things of this world. Daniel was in Babylon and he was yet the state. He was the prophet of the Most High God. Praise the Lord. You might be working in this world. Listen. Remember, you are a child of the king. Your first obligation is heaven. And when you're challenged, you must say, I, will, I prefer to serve God rather than man. Give it up. This world will soon be destroyed when Babylon was to fall. On the same night, they called Daniel. Come and interpret the handwriting on the wall. Daniel said, this is the handwriting on the wall. This is what it means. Babylon is over. The king says, look, man, I will give you a lot of rich gifts. Daniel said, listen, keep your gifts to yourself because after now, Babylon is over. It doesn't matter. When the men came in, they saw Daniel in his insignia of high office. Middle Persia was beginning, and the Middle Persian rulers wanted a good man to run the kingdom. And they found Daniel well versed. You could be well versed in the affairs of your work, but you, listen, you must remember that the first, your first and highest of priority is heaven. Daniel was more versed in the things of God. And because he was versed in the things of God, he was a faithful man in wherever he was placed. Amen? That is what made him what he was. So God is a rose man to their danger. Let us understand that the kingdoms of this world, the final Babylon is about to fall. Don't accept any position as a bride in this world. Jesus wants to take you and perfect you now. And when he comes and finds you fully fit with the righteous robe of his righteousness, he will say, come and take the highest office in the heavenly kingdom. Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. God bless you. May God be with us. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, merciful God and Savior. Indeed, Father, we thank you so much. You have made things clear to our minds, and what has not been made clear as we study, it will become clearer. This world is on the verge of extinction. The wickedness of this world is no different from the wickedness of the minds of men in the time of Noah. Their imagination is only evil continually. We see it on the minibuses. The only, true, the only songs they choose to play are the worst. We know, Lord, that you will respect the choice of your creatures. We see in the seventh angel that while the men and women of this world are destroying themselves on the angel seventh, an aspect of God's character will be revealed that God respects the right to choose and to suffer the consequences of their choice without intervening. So the 144,000 will not be able to intervene. They will leave the rejecters of God's mercy to reap that which they have sown. Grant, O oh Father, that the universe, as they look down, they will see God. They will see the life and character of God fully revealed in the final generation of living saints. And the remnant will shine in the kingdom of God, of their Father. Grant, O oh Father, that we will allow you today to develop us and bring us to the point of full character perfection, irreversible, so that when probation closes, we will not need an intercessor. We will have been sealed in righteousness. Bless the people now. Dismiss us. Help us to contemplate on the things we have heard. To, to accept the warning. And to find ourselves. To surrender our lives to Jesus. And experience salvation in his kingdom. In Jesus name we pray. Amen.